Hi all. So in this video, we're going to see about CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. So this has been asked previously as a short essay question, like uh, describe the formation and circulation of CSF, functions of CF, CSF, and also as a diagram question to depict the flow of CSF. So we'll see more about this. So CSF or cerebrospinal fluid is basically a fluid that fills up the ventricles and the subarachnoid space of the brain. See, these are the ventricles here and we've got the subarachnoid space. Okay. So the volume of CSF is, CSF is around 150 ml and the rate of production is around 550 ml per day or 0.35 ml per minute. So these values are important. Volume 150 ml, rate of CSF production is 550 ml per day or 0.35 ml per minute. So from where is CSF produced? So the CSF is formed mainly from these choroid plexus. These, these special specialized cells here, see these are the choroid plexus. They produce the two-thirds of the CSF. So majority of the CSF is secreted by the choroid plexus located in the brain ventricles, particularly the lateral ventricles. So see it is basically a two-stage process. See choroid plexus basically filter out the blood. Okay. They act like a sieve to filter out the blood. So this is a two-stage process. First, there will be a passive filtration and then active secretion. So see, suppose this is the uh, cerebral artery. And here you've got this modification. Here we've got the modification which is called the choroid plexus. It's a cauliflower-like modification of the uh, blood vessel is called choroid plexus. So see, when blood flows through these cerebral arte arteries, first it just gets passively filtered out okay so that is the first step passive filtration and after that these cells will actively secrete some ions also and thus form the CSF so the formation of CSF is a two-step process it includes a passive filtration as well as an active secretion that is why the composition of CSF is different from that of blood right so here we said that the choroid plexus produce two-thirds of the CSF what about the rest one third? So the rest one third is by the ependymal surfaces of all ventricles. See, all the uh, surfaces of the ventricles also can produce some amount of CSF. And also some portion of CSF comes through the perivascular spaces. That means the space that is surrounding the blood vessel. That also can form this CSF. So basically we've got three sources. First and the most important is the choroid plexus and then we've got ependymal surface of all ventricles and perivascular surfaces, spaces, okay. So now we'll move on to the circulation of CSF. So this can be better shown with the help of a diagram. So suppose this is an outline of the brain showing the uh, different parts and this is the brain stem and here you've got the subarachnoid space, right. So this is a lateral ventricle. And as I said before, we've got choroid plexus, which is present in the ventricles of the brain, which is going to produce the uh, CSF, right? So the choroid plexus will form CSF, which first fills the lateral ventricle. And through, from these lateral ventricles, through this small opening, which is called the foramen of Monroe, okay? So this is the foramen of Monroe. Through this foramen of Monroe or interventricular foramen, the CSF flows to the next ventricle which is the third ventricle see we've got a third ventricle here it fills up the third ventricle and from the third ventricle through this small opening which is called the aqueduct of sylvius or cerebral aqueduct it is going to fill up this diamond shaped ventricle here which is called the fourth ventricle now from the fourth ventricle it is going to fill up this sterna magna right through this opening here which is called the foramen of magendi so see from fourth ventricle basically we've got three openings one is for amen of meganti but we've got two lateral openings also which cannot be shown in this section so that lateral opening is called for amen of lushka okay so this is for amen of meganti and thus it fills this cisterna magna and fills up and then it fills up the whole subarachnoid space right and then finally it is going to drain into these small opening here which is called arachnoid villi right so this is how the CSF circulates. So first we said it fills up the lateral ventricle, flows out through the foramen of Monroe and then fills the third ventricle, goes through the uh, cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle. From there through the foramen of Maganti it goes up, 
uh, fills the cisterna magna and then is going to fill the whole subarachnoid space and then it is going to finally reach the arachnoid villi so this is the circulation of csf right so we can depict this in the form of a flow chart from lateral ventricles through foramen of monroe to the third ventricle then through aqueduct of sylvius to the fourth ventricle from there through foramen of lashka and foramen of maganti to the cisterna magna and then to the subarachnoid space now remember from the fourth ventricle it also fills up the central canal of the spinal cord so this is how csf circulates right so now we will see about the absorption of csf so as i said before it is absorbed by these arachnoid villi okay so from these arachnoid villi where does it go it is going to fill up this venous sinus see just outside this uh, arachnoid matter we've got the superior sagittal sinus right so it is into this superior sagittal sinus or venous sinus that the arachnoid villi is going to drain so basically it is going to reach the blood itself reach is going back to the heart by entering the circulation so this is how the csf is absorbed so this flow of csf into this venous sinus is also called bulk flow and this actually depends on the csf pressure so we'll see more about that see the absorption of csf by the arachnoid villi depends on the csf pressure so why does csf flows out through this arachnoid villi that is because the colloidal osmotic pressure of the plasma is 25 mm of mercury higher than csf see here the outside in the plasma the colloidal osmotic pressure is more which means it is going to it is going to favor absorption right not only that the hydrostatic pressure of csf is higher so from this side you've got a push and from that side you've got a pull so that is why you've got the absorption of csf occurring through this arachnoid villi so see here also that starling's forces is going to play the colloidal osmotic pressure is more here the hydrostatic pressure of csf is more which is why absorption is taking place so thus based on this formation and absorption we can actually draw a graph to show what are the factors that affect the formation and absorption so on the x axis we can uh, draw the outflow pressure of csf and on the y axis you can draw the flow per ml so what was the uh, flow of uh, formation of csf flow in ml per minute we said it was around 0.35 ml per minute right so that is the formation and it is going to remain constant whatever the outflow pressure is so the formation is always constant at 0.35 ml per minute okay but what about absorption see absorption will depend on the outflow pressure so if the outflow pressure is say around 68 mm of csf then there is not going to be any absorption but if the csf pressure increases say up to 112 the absorption will also increase thereafter as the outflow pressure increases absorption also increases so this is a graph showing the relationship between the formation and absorption of csf okay so now we'll move on to the functions of csf so what is the most important function of csf to protect from protect the brain from the mechanical injury protect the brain parenchyma from mechanical injury so how does csf do do that see csf actually reduces the weight of the brain from approximately 1400 grams to 50 grams due to this buoyancy and how is csf able to produce this buoyancy that is because of the difference in the specific gravity or density between the brain and csf see the uh, the csf the specific gravity of brain is around 1.040 where that of csf is around 1.007 which means the brain can float freely in the csf so this buoyancy will minimize the risk of routine acceleration and deceleration injuries see later on you in forensic and all you learn about these coup and contra coup injuries and all so basically csf will help the brain to remain protected because it's got a specific gravity almost similar to that of brain so that it can float the brain can float in the csf and thereby protect the brain right now the next function of csf is that it produces a micro environment for brain cells see you know all these neurons in the brain they are very highly sensitive 
So CSF will produce a stable microenvironment. It will buffer any changes that are going to occur in the oxygen, glucose, pH or temperature, which means it will help to ensure a constancy of external environment of the neurons. Right, so it's a good microenvironment for the brain cells. The third function is that it has a role in homeostasis. How? It has an indirect role in uh, homeostasis because it can regulate the various physiological processes such as respiration, BP, water intake and visceral function. See, remember we in the chemical regulation of respiration, we had talked about the different chemosensitive respiratory neurons and all, right? So based on this, the CSF can actually maintain uh, constant levels of blood pH, PO2 and PCO2 because of these chemosensitive respiratory neurons in central chemoreceptors. So because of this, CSF has got a role in homeostasis also. And finally, it has got an important role in removal of proteins and waste products. So see, it, uh, it removes the waste products from the metabolism of brain and spinal cord. So thus, it helps to maintain a uh, post good environment for the neuronal cells. So these are the important functions of CSF. So thus we have covered the formation, the circulation, the absorption of a CSF and also we have seen that graph and functions of CSF. Okay. So now we will move on to some applied aspects. The most important applied aspect of about CSF is lumbar puncture. So as I always say, if, uh, it's all, always, if a short note is asked, it is always good that you add some points about applied aspect or any clinical aspects. Okay. So what is lumbar puncture? Lumbar puncture is a procedure by which the CSF can be accessed through the lumbar segments of the spinal cord. Okay. So basically, we are going to take some CSF through the lumb through this uh, between the lumbar vertebrae. So we insert a needle between the lumbar vertebrae, reach the subarachnoid space, and drain some CSF. Okay. And what is the use of this lumbar puncture? It can be used for diagnosis because the CSF that is collected by lumbar puncture can be analyzed to see whether there are any infections or malignancies etc. And it can also be used for therapeutic process because drugs can be instilled into the CSF. Okay, for be it for anesthesia or antibiotics and all, we can add drugs to this uh, space. Okay, so lumbar puncture has got uses for diagnosis as well as therapeutic purpose. So finally, moving on to the clinical aspects. So the most important condition which is associated with CSF is hydrocephalus. So what is hydrocephalus? Hydrocephalus means there is an abnormal accumulation of CSF within the brain ventricular system. See, we said that there should be a balance between the formation of CSF and absorption of CSF, right? If there is any problem with this pathway, there is going to be abnormal accumulation of CSF, okay, which is called hydrocephalus because these cavities will all, all be enlarged because of the increased CSF pressure. So there are two types of CSF. One is called communicating CSF, communicating hydrocephalus. What is meant by communicating? See here, CSF absorption is affected. The, here the, there is some problem with the arachnoid villi. So CSF absorption is affected. Okay. But the, the communication between the ventricles and subarachnoid space is normal. So what happens is there is continuous formation of CSF, but it is not able to go out. Okay, so that is called communicating hydrocephalus. So impaired CSF absorption with intact ventricular subarachnoid communication. That is meant by communicating hydrocephalus. So what is non-communicating or obstructive hydrocephalus? Here there is an obstruction between the ventricles and subarachnoid space. See somewhere suppose there is an obstruction in this aqueduct of Sylvius. So what happens is this uh, these ventricles get enlarged continuously because there is a outflow obstruction. So that is called non-communicating or obstructive hydrocephalus. So the CSF flow obstruction between the ventricles and subarachnoid space is called non-communicating hydrocephalus. So th that is some applied aspect about clinical aspect of CSF. So I hope this concept is clear. Thank you.